Alrighty, good morning, church. How you guys doing this morning? You guys doing well? Yeah, you guys doing good this morning? You awake? You alive? All right, rock on. Well, hey, if we, got, if we haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Braden Dykstra. I'm the junior high student pastor here at Free Grace United. And I'm so pumped that you decided to come hang out with us this morning. Can we please welcome all the first timers on the count of three? One, two, three. Woo! Hey, first timers, thanks so much for being here this morning. We appreciate you very much. If you think we're not too weird and you wanna let us know who you are this morning, uh, grab that Here Today card uh, that should be located in your seat back and fill it out at some point uh, and turn it in uh, in the bucket as it passes you by a little bit later. Um, we'll send you a gift in the mail just for hanging out with us this morning. Now we got a great service lined up for you, but we got some awesome worship uh, to get to right away this morning. And so what I wanna do is I wanna invite you guys to stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet for me, and we're gonna get rolling with some worship right away. Uh, I wanna make sure though, that we're ready to worship an awesome God. I wanna make sure that we are ready to like leave it all out on the field here this morning because God is good, He is worth it, and He is worth our best. Am I right? Come on, am I right? All right, so let's worship God with everything we have this morning because like I said, He is worth it. Let's, let's spend some time in prayer, uh, invite His power and presence into this room this morning. So Jesus, Thank you so much for the opportunity to freely gather in your house this morning. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would meet us here this morning, that your power and presence would fall in this room, that we would all feel you here, uh, that each person would find just the one thing that you wanted them to know here this morning. Because no one's here on accident. Every single person is here for a reason. It's because you have a word designed specifically for each of us. So help us find the one thing that was for us this morning. We ask that we would just bring you honor and glory and praise through this worship this morning. And we just love you so very much, Jesus. Thank you so much for your goodness. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Let's worship this morning. out together. Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is reaching. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking. Oh, can you see it? He's got your healing. Oh, just receive it. Let's receive this this morning. Let's sing this out. Oh, can you feel it? Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is reaching. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking. Yes, He is. Oh, can you see it? He's got your healing. Oh, just receive it. Receive it. Come on. 
You guys can go ahead and be seated. Man, I love that song so much because it's talking about the fact that we worship the same God as the God who did miracles in the Old Testament. Isn't it awesome that God does miracles today? Is that awesome? Is that good news? Yes, God does miracles today. And the cool thing is that we worship the same God here in Elk River as, as other, our other locations in Zimmerman, you know, in Princeton, in Eldor, Iowa, where they're having the women's conference right now, even all the way over in Pakistan. It's the same God who does the same miracles everywhere. How cool is that? That is a big deal, church. It really is really is. Now, we're going to move pour, uh, forward into the next part of our service, but first, uh, we're going to say bye to all the kiddos. So everybody say bye, kiddos. Kiddos are going to head off to kiddo class, uh, so you guys can head off right there. Pastor Carly will meet you by the doorway. Thank you so much, teachers, for taking awesome care of our, of our kids. We appreciate you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, but now, what up, Jameson? Good to see you, bud. <laughs> Uh, we're going to transition in our service now because it is time to bring an offering church. And so up on the screens are going to be the ways, yes, are going to be the ways that we can give. Uh, so they'll be up to, uh, to my left and right and behind me. The best way that we can give here at Free Grace United is online. You can set up online recurring giving, which is pretty slick. You can also give with the rest of the ways there. So you can set up that mobile give, which is pretty cool. If you're watching online, hello, good to see you. Uh, and if, you, uh, if you'd like to mail something in, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and then, of course, if you're in the room this morning, uh, you can give using the envelope located in your seat back. Now, to tell us a little bit more about why we give, I'm going to invite a very special guest up onto the stage. So could you guys please welcome Pastor Ruben to the stage this morning? Yeah, he's going to tell us a little bit for a second about why we give. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Brent. How are you guys doing this morning? You guys doing good? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so I get the opportunity to share with you guys just for a moment. Uh, three things that we're going to be giving our offering to as the summer here progresses. Uh, first, uh, we're giving money for kids to go to camp. How many went to camp as a kid when they were younger? I can raise my hand. I'm a camp kid. Awesome, awesome. And then also, we're going to be giving money for students. Last night, I almost said kids, but most of the students that go are my age. 
if not older, to go to the uh, college here at Free Grace United. If you've been through the college or you're going through the college right now, raise your hand. I'm just curious to see. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I would highly encourage you guys, if you just ever want to grow deeper in your faith, to go to the college. And then last but not least, we're giving money also. We're giving offerings to go towards more church plants. We're planting two churches this fall, one in Albia and then another one in Foley. So it's awesome to continuously see the kingdom. Yeah, that's really nice. It's awesome to continuously see the kingdom of God grow. Who's ever heard the commercial, it's my money and I want it now? J.G. Gentworth. Anyone heard that one? I didn't get too many laughs. Sorry, dad, do. It's my money, exactly, exactly. And so as I was thinking about what I was gonna talk about for offering today, this weekend, that commercial came through my mind. It's my money and I want it now. And it's so funny because that resonates with me because a lot of times I'm an immediate gratification type of guy. I want it right now. I don't wanna wait. I wanna see what God has something for me. I want it right now. Don't, if I see it in the store, I want it now. We'll talk about what it costs later on. But I know that uh, it talks about in Luke, Luke was telling, uh, retelling the story about Jesus and how he, was on, he went on a walk. And on that walk, he saw a, a tree and it wasn't producing any fruit. It was a fig tree and it didn't have any figs on it. And so he spoke to the tree and said, may no one never eat of you again. And so then the next day, the disciples walked by and saw that it had withered up from the roots up. And they said, wasn't that the tree that you spoke to? And he said, yes. And so when I think about that story, I think about a lot of times that if God was showing them possibly to have patience, to trust in him. Sometimes we can get caught up in our money and be closed handed, closed fisted with it. But I think God is saying that, you know what, when we wait upon him, he gets to the root of the situation. He gets to the root. And so he's gonna take care, take care of it from the inside out. So as you give today, remember that God works with the inner man, that being, you know, the foundation. Then he works with the heart and that's the root of it. And so don't be closed fisted with your money. I know that sometimes people get funny about their money. I know sometimes you've heard maybe back in the day, the prosperity message, you're like, oh my gosh, don't talk about money hear about money but then on the other hand sometimes it takes the offering to help push God's word forward and so as you as you give today think about why we give think about what we get to do think about you know what when God uses our funds our resources that we're able to help propel his kingdom forward don't let it be something that holds you back but be open-handed be open be open with what God is doing with you I'm going to pray for the offering then we'll have an opportunity to give all right Dearly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that's going on, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to give to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as you bless the finances that we put forth and give to you, Lord, that you'll be able to take that money, Lord, and you'll be able to do so much more with it than that we could. I thank you, Lord, for everyone here. In your name we pray. Everyone says, awesome. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ruben. Can we get up for Pastor Ruben one more time? Awesome. So the buckets are going to pass, and while the buckets are passing, you can drop your giving in there, and you can also drop your Here Today card in there as the bucket goes past you, but there's one thing we got to talk about. Everybody say one thing. Come on, everybody say one thing. I know you're the 9 a.m. crowd, but I'm not cutting you any slack. You're going to talk with me today, all right? We're going to do this together. So the one thing we got to talk about this morning is camp. We have student camp registration that is currently open. It is amazing, you guys. It is a blast, and also, like, it really gives uh, these kids and students an opportunity to really dial in with their faith on a whole nother level. Um, it's my favorite week of the year, every single year for the last seven years. It's a total blast. And so, uh, camp registration is open, and so Josiah and I shot this ridiculous video of me telling you guys about camp, but just, like, this is my 11th time showing this video that's ridiculous of myself to other people. So just for my own sake, can we like laugh at this video just a little bit this morning? Otherwise, I'm just gonna sit up here and I'm gonna throw up. Like, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go backstage and I'm gonna barf if you guys just sit there like, this kid's dumb. Okay? Can we, can we, like, can we, do we need to practice laugh? Do we need to like a practice laugh? Practice laugh on three. Ready, one, two, three. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so, appreciate you, Carter, love you. Just roll the thing, I'm, I'm done. Are there any boogers in my nose? You got a lot of nose hair. What does that mean? What's up, dudes? Hope you guys are doing great. I'm, I'm not talking anymore. I am super pumped to let you guys know that it is the most wonderful time of the year. Not Christmas, but camp registration season. <laughs> camp registration! Let's go. Yes. Fist punch. <laughs> this is getting worse. Just, just be super hype and stupid. This is great. <laughs> So I want to let you guys know about a couple of the changes that we have for camp this year because there are many, but they're they're but all of them are good. The most important one is that we're going to say so long, so long to Camp Swampy in Hibbing, uh, and instead we're going to say hello to our new camp down in Eldora, Iowa. Guys, this place has showers. It has toilets that flush. 
and it has a pool and heating and air conditioning. Ugh. Oh, it's gross. It's so bad. So something else that's super awesome about gout, about, camp, about gout? I just said gout. This is so weird. So we have elementary student camp from July 24th to July 29th, and then we have high school and middle school student camp from July 31 through August 5th. And believe it or not, transportation is included. So if you wanna drive your kid all the way to camp so that you can see the camp for yourself, that's totally fine. But if you want them to be bussed up there, uh, you'll just let us know on your registration form. It's gonna be so cool, you guys. So this year, our theme for camp is identity. We're gonna be going through Ephesians 2.10, talking about how we wanna make sure we're finding our identity in Christ, as opposed to identity in what the world says about us instead, which is gonna be super, super awesome. We're gonna have bonfires, hang out around the campfire together. Uh, we're gonna to have airsoft up at camp. We've got, we've got archery, we've got riflery, we've got ax throwing, which is gonna be heavily supervised, which is gonna be great. We got gaga ball, which I know is like super competitive up at camp. Be prepared to get wrecked in Gaga Ball by me. Uh, the cost per student is $375 per student, but wait, is there record scratch? If you get registered as soon as possible, uh, we, will, we will be able to knock off 50% off of your, your registration fee while supplies last. So you gotta go do it. You just get, you gotta you know, fight to, the, to get there first. So that knocks you down from like 375 all the way down to like 187. Cause was that, was that spot on like head math right there? I hope so, that'd be great. And I can guarantee you, you come hang out this summer, you will increase your relationship with Christ by a whole lot. So come hang out with us this summer. Be there or be lame. It's going to be a blast. To get registered, I need a hat. I need an Uncle Sam hat. Pine Lake camps want register you because camp. Oh, how the turntables. <laughs> Probably good. All right. Yeah, so camp registration is open. Go get your students registered for camp. I'm so sorry that we had to witness that together. My sincere apologies. Uh, go get registered for camp, though. There's two things I'm going to let you guys know really, really fast. The first thing is that that 50% off code to get your kids registered at half price is almost gone. So if you want to, like, you know, capitalize and save some money, you got to get that done ASAP because it's going to be gone quick. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that transportation is included for only the weeks of FGU camp. So that's July 24th to the 29th and then July 31 through August 5th. Transportation is included for those ones, not the other ones. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Aiden. I appreciate that. All right, guys, if I could have you stand up on your feet for me, that'd be awesome. We're going to move back into a time of worship now, and this would normally be the part of the service uh, where we would take communion together, but we're actually going to take that at the end of the service together. Pastor Ben will lead us in taking that at the end of the message today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move back into a time of worship, and the song that we're going to sing next is called Reason to Praise. And this is one of my favorite songs that we sing, every, like hands down, one of my favorite songs that we sing because it's a good reminder it doesn't matter what happened this week. It doesn't matter what happened this month. It doesn't matter what happened maybe even this morning. That God is still good. God is still in control. He still cares. And at the end of the day, there is always a reason to be thankful. And there is always a reason to praise. And so with everything that we've got this morning, let's leave it all out on the field this morning. Let's tell, let's tell God how good he is. And let's sing this next song together. When there's 
no way out There's one thing I know You're still on your throne So whatever I'm feeling I still got a reason to praise And praise And praise somebody and tell them, thanks for coming to church with me today. How are you doing 9 a.m. church this morning? You guys doing good? You guys, I have to say, Pastor Braden, I actually think that video is hilarious. You did a fantastic job. Do you guys think it's funny? 
I know it's 9 a.m. and it's hard, but you know what? He's the perfect, perfect blend between Pastor Eric Dykstra and SpongeBob SquarePants. Is he not? I love it. Thank you so much. And you know what? I did student ministry for four years, so I know what that feels like to try to be the dancing monkey that makes everybody laugh and then to preach a sermon. It's hard to do, so he did a fantastic job. My name is Ben, by the way. I did a good job of introducing myself this time. Uh, I am the pastor of Free Grace in Albertville. My wife and I uh, also recently just planted, along with uh, a lot of our family, Pastor Frank Ibanez, uh, Free Grace and Espanol, which is super good. That's happening today at noon, um, which they launch on Easter, and they're doing a fantastic job. And it is true. Pastor Eric talked about at all of these churches, it's the same God. And it's super cool to go to each one of these churches and, and feel the same church. I think that's really cool. Like, the only difference... Uh, between right now and noon when the Spanish church happens, instead of Romans, it's going to say Romanos. Everybody say Romanos. It's super cool to hear the same message preached in a different language, and I love that. And so if you have a Bible, you can open up to Romans chapter 3. If you have a phone, you can open up to Romans chapter 3. To me, a Bible is so much better. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a phone, first of all, go to Verizon, get yourself a cell phone. Second of all, all of the verses are going to be on the screens. But I would say, if you own a Bible, to me, there's not a better sound in the world than the sound of the turning pages of a Bible in the house of God. Do you agree with that? And so I like bringing my own Bible to church, even when I'm not preaching. I like marking it up and and seeing what God shows me and then reading that later on. Now, before we get started, if it's okay with you, I thought that today would be a good day to say kind of a special prayer all together, if that's okay with you. I'm sure that you guys saw on Facebook and on Instagram that this weekend, or this past week, Pastor Eric's dad went to be with Jesus. And that's a really tough time for the whole family. That's a difficult season to be in. I know that they're very grateful, and we're very grateful that we know where Pastor Paul Dykstra is. Amen? You went to be with Jesus. But just for a second, before we even dive into, t- into today's text, I wanted to ask, if you are one of these four people, will you raise your hand? If you gave your life to Jesus at this church, if you were baptized at this church, if you found your calling in ministry at this church, or if you became closer to God at this church, can you put your hand in the air? That is a lot of people. Can we give all the praise and glory to God for just a minute? Because we know, at the end of the day, that was God's doing. God did all of that, and I'm grateful because my hand was up too. I'm a part of one of those four people. I'm more than one. I'm a few of those people here at this church. And if you volunteer here, if you're a part of financially contrib- uh, contributing to this ministry, every hand that was raised is a part of your legacy of faith. Like You, that, you have a part to play and all of that, but let's also not forget that our senior pastor, every hand that was raised is a, is a part of the legacy of faith of Pastor Eric and Pastor Kelly who stepped out in faith and planted this church and risked everything, which we're all grateful for that. But we talked just a couple weeks ago about leaving a legacy of faith, and I think everyone here would agree that Pastor Eric's legacy is as much his as it is Pastor Paul Dykstra's. That Pastor Paul, uh, he was involved in ministry for a great portion of his life, working in churches and teaching people about Jesus, but he didn't let that ministry, he didn't say, well, I'm just a pastor at a church. He understood that as a follower of Christ, he is the pastor of his home. And he took that ministry home and he passed that faith on to his children. And then Pastor Eric passed it on to many of us. And so I'm grateful for Pastor Paul leaving a legacy of faith. And I hope that one day, every one of us who just had our hands raised, I hope that one day when we go to meet Jesus, that there's a whole room of people just like this who have their hands raised that say, I will go to heaven because of your legacy of faith. Amen? And so as we're gonna pray for today's text and the the sermon today, I also just wanted to take a moment and pray for that family and, and, and for Pastor Paul. So if you'll bow your heads and pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm just so grateful for the way that you used Pastor Paul. I'm grateful that he answered the calling into ministry, not just within a church, but also within his home. God, I, the, the fact that you allow us to participate in what you're doing in the lives of other people just blows my mind. You don't need us, but you invite us to do that. And so I pray that we too will leave our own legacy of faith. Lord, I pray that your peace, which surpasses all understanding, I pray that that would be the peace that is with the Dykstra family right now 
and uh, that they would know that they have a church family here who loves them and who is praying for them. And Jesus, as we open up your word today, our end goal is to become more like you and less like us. I pray that we'd be transformed. Your, your word says the word of God does not return void. So as it's being preached, I know that we're being changed. And so Jesus, I pray that from the inside out, we would look more like you and less like us. We open our ears and we open our hearts up to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. All right, so we are in Romans chapter three. This is technically our fourth week going through the book of Romans, and this is gonna go on for quite some time. And uh, what I wanna talk about today is how good is good enough. If you were to ask basically anybody in the world, how do you get to heaven, most people would answer the same question. I mean, most people outside of the church, they, they would answer with a typical answer of, well, you just gotta be a good enough person. You do good deeds, you make sure that you're not telling lies, that you're being kind, that you're paying back, all of these things. If you're a good enough person, well, then you get to heaven. And you know, right here we have some research, 48% of people, this is from Arizona Christian University, 48% of United States adults agreed with this statement, that a person who is generally good, who does enough good things for others, will earn a place in heaven. That's what 48% of, and I, like, that's from Arizona Christian University, but I think that if you were to go to, uh, leave the doors of this church and go out to Elk River, go to Otsego, wherever you're coming from, you go back to your neighborhood and you knock down the doors of everybody in your neighborhood and you ask, how do we get to heaven? You'd get the same typical answer. Well, we gotta be good people. So in Romans chapter three, we're gonna answer the question, how good is good enough? Are you ready? Now, what I've been telling my church as I've been preaching through this is the book of Romans, probably more than any other book in the New Testament, is going to challenge you. It's going to push you. Some parts of Romans are like, you have to really wrestle with it, and what I've been telling my church is that is perfectly okay. It's okay to wrestle with scripture. It's a, that's part of a relationship, isn't it? It's okay to ask the questions, and so I'm just giving you an invitation right now that if anything that is said throughout today's message, if it just raises questions in your heart, ask the questions. Come forward, you can talk to me, you can talk to Pastor Ruben, you can talk to Pastor Brad, and you can talk to any of the pastors that are here. Ask the questions, but really chew on the scripture and see what, it, now, this is gonna be a pretty heavy set of passages that we read, so I have to ask the question, are you my friend? Do we love one another? Okay, just remember that as we're going through point number one. Are you ready? Okay. Romans chapter three, starting in verse nine, says this. We already know that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one, their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace and they have no fear of God at all. Obviously the law applies to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses to show that the entire world is guilty before God. Are you glad you came to church this morning? I got an easy passage to preach today. So to answer the question, how good is good enough, we get Paul's answer right here. The answer is, well, no one is good enough. No one is good enough and we are all messed up. Now, we have to understand that the book of Romans is one letter read to a church, right? It's not divided by chapters as he wrote this letter. It's just one letter that he, the, the pastor would read to the entire church. But this section of Paul's letter, he kind of maps out like a court case. And Paul steps into the courtroom as prosecutor Paul, okay? And we know that God is the judge, right? God is obviously the judge, and Paul steps in as prosecutor Paul, and he just, in the passages we read, you saw that there was a bunch of quotation marks. He pulled 14 different passages from the Old Testament, mostly from Psalms and Isaiah, and he lays out 14 accusations against all of mankind. 
14 charges against all of mankind, and he sets them on the table, and he says, this is the indictment in the court of law against all of mankind. Now, obviously, Paul knows that he's also the defendant, that he's mixed in with mankind, but he's playing the part of prosecutor Paul. And there's a couple words that prosecutor Paul repeats over and over again. The first one was no one. Everybody say no one. No one. Let's go back to the text for just a second. He said, no one is righteous. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God, and no one does good, not a single one. That's four times Paul says the word no one. Then he's got another word that he repeats kind of over and over again. It's the word all. Everybody say all. All. He says, all people are under the power of sin. All have turned away. All have become useless. And at at the end, I would include this one. He says, to to show that the entire world is guilty before God. And so we have four no ones and we have four alls. What is the indictment that Paul is putting against all of mankind? No one is righteous and all are guilty. That's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Now, of course, I'm talking about before our relationship with Christ. Our our default state is no one is righteous and all are guilty. And then it's almost as if Prosecutor Paul brings Dr. Paul up to the stand. And he says, I want Dr. Paul to give us a a, a brief x-ray from head to toe of just how bad this infection really is. Going back to the text, Paul starts with the head. He says, no one is truly wise, so he starts with the head. With the eyes, he says, no one is seeking God. He moves to the mouth, he says, their tongue is foul. And he says, like a stench from an open grave. It's like everything within us is just this stench from an open grave. Their tongue is filled with lies. Snake venom venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And then he moves to the feet and he says, and they rush to commit murder. Their feet rush to commit murder. So Dr. Paul says, from head to toe, We are infected with this disease called sin. And Prosecutor Paul says, and no one is exempt. No one is righteous and all are guilty. Paul's answer is, no one is good enough. We look at Psalm chapter 51. David even writes this. He says, I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Now, Paul, uh, David's not saying that he was conceived like out of wedlock. He was conceived in sin. He's saying, I was a sinner because I am in the family line of Adam. I have sin running through my veins. I have a natural bent to do the wrong thing. Given the choice between right and wrong, without Jesus, we will always choose the wrong thing. Paul calls this, we are slaves to sin. That like every time sin came and knocked on the door before we were with Christ, sin would come and knock on the door. We just opened it and welcomed it in because we didn't have a choice. We were slaves to sin. You know who knows all of this is true? This is a quiet room, isn't it? You know, <laughs> you know who knows that all of this is true? Is anybody who's got kids. Can I get an amen from anybody? Did you have to teach your kids to steal the donuts when you said no? Do you have to teach your kids to sneak out of bed after you put them down, you hear the pitter-patter of their feet running? Did you have to teach your kids to do wrong? Do you have to teach your kids to lie to you? Do you have to teach your kids to talk like that? You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? And the reason why is because what David has just told us is that it's because they're all just a bunch of little sinners. (laughs) I heard an amen. (laughs) I had, I had a kid on the front row last night, and he, she said, hey, <laughs> but it's us too. Without Christ, our, our natural state, our natural bent is towards sin. No one is righteous, and all are guilty. This is what Jeremiah says in, in chapter 17. He says, the heart, it starts with the heart. The human heart is the most deceitful things above all things and is desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So we have these streams of sin in our life. I I commit this sin over here, I do this over here, but any stream that you hop in and you go upstream to where did that really come from, the source of it all is we have sin in our hearts without Christ. We have, we, we start in this natural place that no one is righteous and all are guilty. You know what, there is a light at the end, there is a silver lining though, I'll say that, and that's, that's this. This puts us all in the same boat, doesn't it? 
doesn't matter what your background was, doesn't matter where you grew up, doesn't matter what language you spoke, we are all in the same boat. It's a sinking boat, but we're all in the same boat, aren't we? And it's just a reminder that the Bible is not a story of good people and bad people. Oh, we are the good people, aren't we? We are in here, it's Sunday morning and we're in here and the bad people are out there. That's not the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is all bad people and one good God that loved them all. And so we can't point the finger at each other and say, well, I know what you did. You committed a pretty, uh, my sin was just a baby sin. But your sin was a really bad, we can't do that because the passage we just read last week said, you must, you, you might think you can condemn such people, but you can't because you're just as bad. So we don't point the finger at each other. We point the finger at Jesus and we say, you're flawed and I'm flawed, but he's perfect. Let's just look at him and figure out how to do this whole thing. Let's just keep our eyes fixed on Jesus rather than playing this comparative game all the time. We're all in the same boat. I like one more thing that Paul said in this text. He says, all have become useless. In the New King James Version, it's the word unprofitable. And in Paul's language, the the words useless and unprofitable, it's speaking of fruit that has gone rotten. You ever had rotten fruit on your counter before? The fruit flies come out, you're nodding your head, yeah. We thought we were gonna get all healthy, so we got some bananas and apples, we are gonna change our diet, and well, there it is sitting on the counter today. And it's all rotten, isn't it? If you leave that fruit there for long enough, is it gonna go back to being fresh? No. That's Paul's point. Left on our own, it's not gonna get better, it's only gonna get worse. We've all become useless, and the problem is, most people, everything that I've just said is kind of a weighty subject, I can feel it in the room, and that's okay. Let it sink in for just a minute, because we're gonna get to the good part in a second. But this fact that no one is righteous and all are guilty, the problem is, most people don't believe that this is true. Most people today say, well, there's, yeah, of course there's a few bad apples out there, but I'm not one of them. I mean, I'm a pretty good guy, and most people don't believe that this is true, that deep down there is a problem, and that's why people in our culture today will never seek a savior until they admit that they're a sinner. We have a culture that won't turn to Christ because they don't think that they need him, and when we preach messages that talk about words like repentance, people stand up and they walk out of the room because what do I have to repent from? I'm a pretty good guy, I'm a pretty good girl, like I don't, I don't, I don't make a whole lot, I'm, of course there are bad apples out there and I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty good. But the truth is, until we admit that there's a problem, we will never seek a savior. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter nine, verse 12, he said, I did not come for those who think that they are righteous. I came for those who know that they are sinners. I didn't come for those who think that they're healthy, but those who know that they're sick. And so our first step in a relationship with God is a step of humbling ourselves, isn't it? And acknowledging the fact that I'm a pretty messed up person and I've broken a lot of things and I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and I've, I've, I've committed a lot of sins. But as soon as you humble yourself to that position, now all of a sudden look back at Matthew chapter nine, verse 12, Jesus said, then you are the one I came for. I came for those who know that they are sick, not those who think that they're healthy. And in Matthew chapter five, we just did the Sermon on the Mount Uh, a few weeks ago, we did 14 weeks going through the Sermon on the Mount, and the first thing that Jesus says in the Beatitudes is what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Everybody say blessed. Blessed, happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When it says poor in spirit, he's not talking about a bunch of Eeyores walking around. He's talking about people who are spiritually impoverished. That I don't have any good merit of my own. I don't have spiritual merit to offer God to say, look, I, I deserve some, some of the salvation that you can offer. No, we are poor in spirit. We're reduced to spiritual beggars. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit and those who realize their need for him. And then he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the answer to how good is good enough is it, it's not a fair question because no one is good enough. But if we will humble, humble ourselves and say, 
Jesus, I need you, I'm a sinner, then we have a savior, amen? Move on to verse 20, I like this one. It says, for no one can be made right with God by obeying what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. I'm gonna read the whole thing again because that's, that's a huge part to today's text. No one can be made right with God by obeying what the law commands, by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. So last Saturday, my daughter Macy, she's eight years old, she was at a birthday party at Great Wolf Lodge and she was climbing down the bunk bed and she was on the second to last step, but she thought she was on the last step. And so you know how that story ends, right? She just starts walking, thinking she's at the bottom, and she falls down and she hurts her wrist. And I picked her up and she said, my wrist kind of hurts. I said, all right, well, we'll keep an eye on it. We went to church the next day and her wrist was still bothering her. So after church on Sunday last week, I brought her into urgent care. They did an x-ray and it turned out that Macy had broken her wrist. It's just a small fracture, um, but she had broken her wrist. And so they take the x-ray and they bring the report back uh, of the x-ray and the doctor's like, yep, looks like Macy has broken her wrist. Now, would it have been reasonable for me to take that report and march my way down the hall to radiology and start screaming at the x-ray machine? How dare you? You broke my daughter's arm. I have a certain set of skills. I will hunt you down. I will find you and I will kill you. How dare you? You know, like, does that make any sense? No. Because what does the x-ray machine do? It simply shows that something is broken. It didn't cause the break. So we don't look at God's word and when it's like a mirror and it shows us where we're at and that things are kind of off, we don't look at God's word and say, how dare you? It's just a picture that's showing us where we are at. It didn't cause the break. It just shows me that something is broken in here. I need something else to fix the problem. And so... Point number two is this, our idea of a solution. We know that there's a problem, and our idea of the solution is this. We just try harder. Try harder to be good. Follow the Ten Commandments. But the law only, the law just reveals how messed up we are. Our natural reaction, church, is when Dr. Paul gives us the diagnosis from head to toe that we are infected with sin. Our natural response is, okay, good doctor, Well, what can I do to help the condition? There must be a checklist of things that I can do. I have this problem of sin. Well, what are the things that I can do to dig my way out of this? And what Paul is trying to tell us is, uh, when when you're talking about that checklist, you're referring to the law. Well, if I can just obey it perfectly, I can dig my way out of this. But Paul's saying, the law can't fix the problem. The law just shows that there is one. Think about it, if I, if I went home, and I took my temperature and it turns out I got a fever. I got a fever of 103, right? And, I, oh man, I'm, I'm pretty sick. So I stick the thermometer back in my mouth and take it out. It still says 103. And I do that all day long. And all of a sudden I'm like, man, it's 104. I call my wife, I call my mom. Guys, I'm really scared. I, I've been taking my temperature all day long. I'm not getting any better. That wouldn't be right, would it? Can the thermometer actually heal the sickness? No, it just shows that one is there. That's what the law, it shows that there's a sickness there, but we need something else to heal us. What about a mirror? Anybody here not a morning person? Okay, I'm on and off. I'm a pretty much a morning person 24 seven, but some days I just can't. I don't know if I, say I didn't sleep good or whatever, but this is what I do when I can't wake up in the morning. I stare in the mirror and I can't pull myself to do anything about, you know, I got morning breath, I gotta take a shower, I got all this stuff, and I just can't seem to do any of it. I just stare, and if I stare into that mirror all day long, if you stare into the mirror all day long, are your teeth gonna get cleaned? Are your nose hairs gonna get trimmed? Is your BO gonna go away? No, because the mirror just shows that we are unclean. We need something else to clean us, that's the law. The law just shows us that there's a problem, but it can't actually fix the problem. The same way if you go to an amusement park and you stand under the, stand under the mark and it says, you must be this tall to ride the ride. If I stand under it and I find out I'm not quite tall enough, first of all, if I'm not tall enough still, there's a problem, right? But I stand under it, it says, not tall enough. Can I use the ruler at all to make myself taller to be able to ride the ride? 
No, I just have to steal my older brother's boots and put his on so that now I'm tall enough I can ride the ride. You see what I'm saying? The ruler just shows that I didn't quite measure up, but it can't make me measure up. That's what the law does. It shows us that we have not measured up. We have fallen short of the standard, but it can't make us so that we meet the standard. This is Romans chapter 7, verse 7. It says, well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law, listen to this, it was the law that showed me my sin. It's just a snapshot. It just shows that there is a problem. I would have never known that coveting was wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. Another one, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 says this, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to, what's that next word? Show people their sins, not to fix the sin, to show people the sins, but the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Who's that? Jesus is the solution. Sin is the problem. The law is the measurement that shows us the problem. But Jesus is the solution. It's not about you digging your way out and you accomplishing enough of that checklist to make yourself right with God. The reality is this. The law will always condemn the best of us. But the grace of Jesus will always save the worst of us. The law will always condemn the very best of us. You might be the best at following that law. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus is speaking to the multitudes. But he's kind of pointing at the Pharisees. And he says, hey, unless your righteousness, your good deeds, unless your works exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven and you can just hear the jaws drop on that mountain that day. You kidding me? I have to, if they're not getting in, there's no way that we're getting in. These guys are famous for their self-righteousness. They're famous for trying to keep up with that checklist as much as possible. What does it tell us? The law will always condemn the best of us, but the grace of Jesus will always save the very worst of us. You think about Jesus on that cross and he had the man sitting next to him, the thief on the cross next to him, what does Jesus say to that man? Even today, you will be with me in paradise. What did that man ever do for Jesus? What did he do for Jesus? Nada. He did, I'm just practicing for Spanish church. Nothing. Oh, but I know, I, I, I didn't do a whole lot of good before I was saved, but Jesus saved me so that I could do all these good things, and that, that's why I'm here. I have to still keep up with the checklist now. Well, let's ask a question. What did that man do after he was saved? Died. That's it. He didn't, it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with his works. He just trusted in Jesus, and I believe when that man passed into eternity, he heard the famous words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because grace will always save the worst of us. But the law will condemn the best of us. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 says this, And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which comes from the law, but that which is through faith in who? In Christ. The righteousness which is from God by what? Faith. The last passage we studied, it said from faith to faith from start to finish by faith. Not by your works, by your faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna get to the, the next passage in Romans here, and this is where things start turning really good for the better, okay? And I like to read a lot when I'm studying for, for sermons, and I read a couple commentators. One guy named Donald Rayburn said, in all of his years of studying the Bible, he has now become convinced that the passage that we're just about to read, he said, this is the most important paragraph in all of the Bible. Now we understand that, Every Bible verse matters. There's not one Bible verse that's not good, right? Every Bible verse is good, but you know what he was saying. This right here is, is everything in the gospel is found in these verses right here. Another guy named Leon Morris said, I believe this is the most important paragraph that's ever been written, not just in the Bible. So let's, let's get to it. Let's read it now. It says, verse 21, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in who? 
Jesus Christ. We are made right with God, not by what you do, but by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And it is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned. There Paul goes again. No one is righteous. All are guilty. Everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Let's pause right there for a second. Let's say we go to the Grand Canyon. Anyone here been to the Grand Canyon? I've been there. It is beautiful, okay? If you ever get the chance, drive up to the Grand Canyon or down, depending on where you're at. But um, I read yesterday that on average, Grand Canyon is 10 miles wide. I couldn't believe it. Because from that distance, like, it's hard to tell quite how far away that is. But 10 miles, that's, that's quite a long ways. So what if we went there, and I got three of you, and I said, okay, all you have to do to attain righteousness is jump from here to the other side. You're like, let's go. <laughs> let's do this, okay? So you run, and you jump, and you make it four feet. Well, that's not quite 10 miles, is it? <laughs> Didn't make it. Fell short of the standard. And then we get Pastor Ruben and his, his joggers, and he's got, he's got big muscles, right? And he gets a running head start, and he just bolts it, and he runs, and he passes you, but he makes it six feet. Ha, <sighs> didn't quite make it. Then we get the great Olympian, Pastor Braden Dykstra, okay? And he's, he's, he's lighter, he's quicker, he's been training for it. He goes all the way back here, and he gets a running head start, and he jumps, and he makes it 12 feet. That's a huge jump, isn't it? It's a church record in failure. He jumped a lot farther than the first guy, but 10 miles is still nothing, like 12 feet is nothing compared to 10 miles. And so we can say, yes, in some regards, some have jumped a little bit further, but we all fell desperately short of God's glorious standard. Are you with me? But what's the next word? Yet, I love when the Bible says yet. It's like everything's about to get better now. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Can I get an amen from that? So Paul first tells us how we are not made right with God. It's not by your works, not by obeying the law. We are made right with God, now he tells us, by believing in Jesus Christ. And by raising hands, how many here know who Martin Luther is? Or maybe you've heard the name Martin Luther, one of the founding fathers of the great reformation of the church. It was these verses that you just read, these were the verses that he was reading when the reformation started in his own heart and out came all of that happened in the 1500s. These were the verses that he was reading. It says that he pondered them day and night until I fully grasped that in here lies the full gospel. Because he was a Catholic monk, and he was preaching what the Catholic monks, monks preach, that we are justified by our work. Here's some theology words, big words. You guys want to hear some? So when Pastor Eric comes back, you can tell him you know a bunch of big theology words, right? There's two types of theologies when it comes to our justification. Well, there's probably millions, but what I'm talking about is there's monergistic and synergistic theologies. Synergistic theology looks like this. Okay, I can't quite do it with a microphone. But God reaches out and grabs your arm, and you reach up, and you grab his arm. That God has a part to play in your salvation, but you also have a part to play in your salvation. God does some of the work, but you still have some work that you have to do. And to, to say that this is right is to say, well, Jesus did a lot of the work of my salvation, but he didn't quite do it all. And I have to supplement what Christ did not finish. That's funny, I just realized I have a tattoo right here. What does it say? Oh, it's finished. There's no more work to do. I don't have to supplement anything for Christ. His sacrifice on Calvary was plenty enough for all of us. And so that's synergistic that I have to do a little bit. And this is what Martin Luther realized is that there's monergistic theology where God alone reached down and picked us up and saved us and had nothing to do with my own efforts. It was in spite of me. Uh, when my son was about three years old, Jack, he's about six now, so this is about three years ago, we took him to the beach, and he was swimming, and he had a life jacket on, and there was a bunch of kids that were swimming, and we looked away for like, just, I mean, we're talking with other parents, but we're keeping an eye on the kids, and finally we looked back, and Anna saw it first, my wife saw it first, but Jack is swimming kind of like this with his face in the water, and he doesn't do that, and what had happened is he had 
kind of gone to a drop off and he had gone sideways and his life jacket was keeping him afloat, but he can't reach with his hands or his feet to touch the bottom so he can't push himself back up. It was like the scariest moment I've ever faced as a dad. And Ann and I, like we were not dressed for, to go swimming, but before I even realized what was going on, my, mom, or my wife was Usain Bolt sprinting down the beach running into the water with shoes, pants, everything, running in, and you know what she didn't do? She didn't reach down and say, I did some of the work, Jack, but you gotta meet me halfway here. You gotta do it. Would that have been a good parent at all? Is our God a good father? He saw you drowning in your sin and you did not have an arm or leg to stand upon. That there was nothing that you could have done to save yourself and he reached down and he picked you up and it had nothing to do with your works. Jesus says, it is finished. So here's point number three. Here's God's solution to the problem. No matter how messed up our behavior, we are made right with God by believing on Christ. Has nothing to do with your behavior. Has everything to do with your belief. I believe in Jesus Christ. This is what Acts chapter 16 says. What must I do to be saved? Well, perfect church attendance. You must read your Bible every day and pray. You must fast at least twice a year. Are these things great things? Absolutely, these are amazing things. But what does it say about our salvation? How are we made right with God? What must I do to be saved? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved because it has nothing to do with your works. It has everything to do with God's grace. Nothing to do with my works, nothing to do with yours, everything to do with God's grace. And so earlier, we looked at a bunch of pronouns. No one is righteous and all are guilty. But now let's look at a third pronoun that Paul throws out, everyone. He says, this is true for everyone who believes. Say everyone. What does everyone mean? Everyone means everyone. What does it mean in the Greek? Everyone, what does it mean in Latin? Everyone, what does it mean in Hebrew? What does it mean in Spanish? It means everyone, and at the end of verse 22, it says, no matter who we are. At the end of verse 24, it says, we are, what does it say? We are free from the penalty of sin. No matter who we are, we are free from the penalty of sin. But Pastor Ben, you don't know me. I'm a chronic liar. No matter who we are, we are free from the penalty of sin. Pastor Ben, you don't know my story. I've committed adultery. No matter who we are, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are free from the penalty of sin. Pastor Ben, I've committed murder. I did time in prison. I've killed somebody. I took a life. No matter who we are, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are free from the penalty of sin because the law will condemn the best of us, but the grace of Jesus Christ will always save the worst of us. And right here in the text, where did it say it? Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. It's free. Uh, Pastor Rubin quoted J.G. Wentworth. Uh, That's a great commercial, by the way. Uh, One commercial I want to quote is the TurboTax commercial. You ever see the one where, in the TurboTax commercial, where it's clearly there's a storyline going on, but they're only using one word the whole time? Free. Free, 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 free. It's like at an auction. Free, 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 free. My favorite one is the gymnastics one where they're like, and free, and free, and free, and free. You know, you've seen these commercials, right? Or am I just looking like an idiot in front of everybody and I watch too much TV or something? Free, 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 free. Every time you see that commercial now, you need to think of this text right here. Freely, he gives his grace. It's free. There's nothing that you could do to deserve it, and there's nothing that you could do to earn it. It is free. We need to remember this because the devil's always going to bring you back to your own self-righteousness. Oh, Ben, you messed up again. You're going to need to make sure you do a couple good deeds to make your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. That's going back to the law. No, I have to say no. I have been made right with God. I have friendship with Jesus because of his grace, which is free. Amen? It's not an award that we earn. It's a gift that we receive, but we must believe in Jesus Christ. The only work that he asks for is believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. And so we're gonna wrap up with the last text right here from Romans chapter three, verse 25. It says, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. 
People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So here's point number four. This is the last one. God's payment method, the blood of Jesus Christ. God's solution for our sin is free, but it wasn't cheap. We have the name of our church plastered on the outside of every church that we have. It's on your note sheets. It's on our college. It's on our student ministry. What's the name of our church? Free Grace. And I'm not standing up here changing that. I absolutely 10,000% believe in that. But 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this. God bought you with a high price. It's a gift. It is free for you, and it's free for me, but it cost him everything. I remember one time I was driving with my dad down the road, and I saw a box that just said free cats on the side of the road. I didn't even have to ask. My dad just said, Ben, there's no such thing as a free cat. Because once you get it, then there's, there's all the costs that come with it. And all my life, every, like, it, it hasn't been about cats, but I'll talk about something. Oh, this guy, he's giving me a car. He's doing this. My dad would always say, Ben, there's no such thing as a free cat. Nothing is free. It's free for you, but it cost Jesus everything. Your, your freedom was paid with the precious blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. Look at this contrast right here in Isaiah chapter 53, verse four through five, it says, yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion and he was crushed for our sins. And then the text goes on It's not on your note sheet, it's not on the screens, but I just wrote it down. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned away every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. What the cross of Jesus tells me is two things. It tells me, first of all, how great the problem was. Talked about the problem of sin, right? tells me how great the problem was because God made the solution appropriate to the problem, didn't he? And if the solution was that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of creation, that he had to shed his blood, if that was the solution, how great was my problem? That's a pretty big one, isn't it? It Shows me how great my problem was, the problem of my sin, but it also shows me how great his love was for me. That Jesus would go through all of that. Church, I want you to know, I believe that Jesus loves you so much. Whether you're following him right now or not, Jesus loves you. And everything that he went through, I think he would have gone through all of that if you were the only person who turned to him because he loves you. And God doesn't need us in heaven. He didn't do all those things because he was bored by himself up in heaven. He said, I need to save some of them so I can have people. He didn't do that because he needed you. He did it because he loves you. He paid a high price just to have you. Shows me how great the problem was and how great his love was for me. And if you need to write this one down, this will help. Jesus was crucified so the wrath of God could be satisfied so that we could be justified. Jesus was crucified so that the wrath of God could be satisfied, so that we could be justified. We could be made right and be in relationship with God. And so I'll just ask the question, what if today you decided to trust in the free grace of Jesus Christ? What if today you decided to say, you know what, I didn't even realize it, but I have been trying to, or I've been going to church for a while, I've been reading the Bible, but I have been trying to earn this whole thing myself. You can't do it, can you? It's not what the purpose of the law was for. What if you said, today I will trust in Jesus Christ. I will believe in him. I will follow him and I will receive the free gift of grace that he offers. 
And so I'm just gonna ask you, everyone, I'm gonna invite you to bow your head, close your eyes. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that right now. And the Bible says it's by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that you are saved. So if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on that cross and that he rose again three days later, now I'm gonna give you that opportunity to make that declaration of faith with your mouth. But I want you to know this is not a a magical prayer that if we just pray this prayer, we sprinkle these words over our life, now we have fire protection in the afterlife, but I'm gonna just keep on living the way that I was already living before. That's not what this is. This is a declaration of your faith that from this day forward, I will choose to trust in Jesus. And I believe that as I do, that he's gonna transform me. He's gonna change me. And so with every eye closed, every head bowed, if the room would just repeat after me, just say, Jesus Christ, I trust in you. I believe that you are good, that you have good plans for me. I know that I've made mistakes and I know that I am a sinner but I ask you to forgive my sins, to make me right with you. I believe in your sacrifice on the cross. And three days later, you rose again. I believe that you're alive today. And so I put my trust in you. I choose to follow you from this day forward. Teach me how to follow you. Teach me what your voice sounds like. I trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate with anyone who just made that decision right now? And if you did, if you just made that decision today, it might have been for the first time of your life, but it might have also been that you just realized that you had drifted back and you were coming back to grace. If you did that today, before you leave, please just come up and talk to Pastor Ruben. Let him know that you made your decision. And after that, you get to do something now that you're a follower is you get, you get to be baptized. Your next step in faith is to get baptized and to go under the water. And what baptism is, we talked about just a couple weeks ago. We said that I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's what baptism is. I don't care who sees. I don't care that if I look like a fool going under that water and coming back up. I don't care if I have to go home or go to lunch with wet hair. I don't care because I want to associate with Jesus Christ and I want the whole world to see it. And when I go under that water, it's me dying to my old life and leaving it behind. And when I come back up, as Galatians 2.20 says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I think baptism is for somebody in this room today. And before you even walk out of this room, Go talk to Pastor Ruben. He's waving his hand. Go ahead. There you go. Talk to Pastor Ruben and let him know before you leave this room. And the last thing would be communion. If you got communion, don't take it quite yet. But you can go ahead and prepare your communion. Because I felt like this would be a good way to wrap up the sermon, talking about the grace of God. We believe at this church, you don't have to be a member at Free Grace United to take communion. We just say, be a part of the family family of faith, that this right here, this is for people who have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ. And what he says in the book of Matthew is he says, take this and do this in remembrance of me, that real body, the, the cracker represents the body of Jesus that was broken. A real body was broken so that you could receive that free grace. And real blood was shed so that we could receive that free grace, that there was a sacrifice that was made. And it's by believing in this sacrifice that we're made right with God. So if you bow your heads and pray with me, I'm closing out of today's sermon and we'll pray for communion. Heavenly Father, we don't take lightly what you gave up. You gave up your son on that cross for our freedom. Jesus, we do not take lightly the sacrifice that you made so that we could be free. We thank you that you went to that cross. Luke chapter nine says that you resolutely set your face toward Jerusalem, that you knew what was gonna happen, it was all in your hands, and you chose to lay your life down for us so that we could have an opportunity for redemption, to be made right with you. So we thank you and we honor you by taking this communion. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Go ahead and take your communion.
That's a good way to end a sermon, I think, don't you? All right, so that was the end of today. If you have any questions about what was talked about, you, you feel free to talk to Pastor Ruben. You can come talk to myself. But if you have questions, just ask the questions. But I'll invite you guys to stand up to your feet as we are dismissing here today. A couple announcements as we do. First of all, every Wednesday at 6.45, we have Deeper. So here in Elk River, Wednesdays at 6.45, you have Bible studies for men and women. You have Recovery. You have Student Church, Free Grace Students for Junior High, and Deeper Kids Discipleship. The whole family can come and get discipleship on Wednesday nights. Uh, secondarily, no Pastor Eric's Bible class this Monday. I like that my screen right here says no PE class just makes me kind of sad inside that I just feel like I just missed gym class. But no, Pastor Eric's Bible class, This it's not meeting this Monday, and it's not meeting Memorial Day Monday as well, so don't show up for that. Uh, third, we have camp coming up, and like Pastor Braden talked about, those 50% off discount codes are going very quick. There are few left, so if you have kids that you want to sign up for camp, get them signed up. You can go to pinelakecamps.org. Uh, next, we have Israel trip coming up this uh, 2023 in January, uh, January 14th through the 24th, if you have not gone to Israel, consider signing up for this trip. Look into it, go to freegrace.tv slash Israel and get all the information. And last but not least, next weekend, we have Family Fun Day. And need I say more, there will be hot dogs, okay? So uh, there's gonna be hot dogs, uh, popsicles, music, bounce house, is gonna be a fun time. A couple things for you to know, first of all, it is not during services or after services necessarily. But on Saturday night, it's gonna be before services from three to 5 p.m. And on Sunday, it's gonna be after all the services from noon to two. And so this is for our entire church. This is for our entire community. So invite your neighbors out for it. It's completely free. Free, 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 right? It's free, but we do need some volunteers to help with this event. So if you'd like to help serve your community, for something like this, like this is something awesome to be a part of. You can uh, talk to Pastor Ruben. There's a lot of things you can talk to Pastor Ruben about. Or you can talk to Pastor Carly. She's just gonna wave her hand. There you go. If you wanna talk to one of them, if you wanna help out with that. Other than that, let's say our blessing on our way out. Psalm 67, one through two, say this with me. God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. God bless you guys. We'll see you back this next weekend for family fun day. If you want to be baptized, talk to Pastor Ruben. And don't forget your kids on your way out. God bless.